Bonjour. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Students of mine over there, perhaps. Um, welcome to the evening portion of our third annual Indigenous Earth History Summit. Uh, the summit is sponsored by the NMU Center for Native American Studies with generous support from the Keweenaw Bay Indian Community um, and the NMU uh, Ethnic and Cultural Diversity Committee. So we appreciate that support. We've had a great day so far, lots of ideas popping around and we're winding up for our, our keynote presenter, which I'm very excited about. Before I get into introducing our keynote, however, a uh, real quick note, we will be in our currently throughout the presentation selling various books by Ward Churchill. Part of those proceeds will go to the Center for Native American Studies, and you can purchase those right over there. And we will be having a book signing after the presentation, after questions and answers and that sort of thing. So if you're looking for an autograph, those books would be a, a great thing to be purchasing right now. All right. Tonight it is my honor and my privilege to introduce Ward Churchill to you. Uh, Ward Churchill is a prolific American Indian scholar and activist, a member of the Rainbow Coalition Council of Elders, he is on the Leadership Council of the American Indian Movement of Colorado. He has written numerous books on indigenous history, addressing environmental and land rights struggles, the devastating impact of American Indian boarding schools, and other genocidal governmental policies. And five of his more than 20 books have received human rights awards. Ward is also someone of whom Howard Zinn has written. Ward Churchill is one of our most powerful chroniclers of Indian history, each one of his books is an education in, himself, in itself. Noam Chomsky has written, Ward Churchill has carved out a special place for himself in defending the rights of oppressed people and exposing the dark side of past and current history. These are achievements of inestimable value. Uh, Ward is a former chair of the Ethnic Studies Department. Until July 2007, Churchill was a tenured full professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he received numerous awards for his teaching and service. In April 2009, Churchill won a lawsuit against the University of Colorado, in which the jury unanimously found that the Colorado University had violated his First Amendment rights by firing him in retaliation for his observations on 9-11. He is currently litigating to have that verdict upheld, and recently the American Association of University Professors has joined the call to have the University of Colorado reinstate him to his former position. Tonight, Mr. Churchill will be speaking on Water is Life, Reflections on an Omnicidal Equation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ward Churchill. See y'all. Hello, my relatives. It's an honor to be here on Ojibwe land. Or Chippewa land, Ottawa land, native land, any of them. I bring you greetings from the south as I come here to the north. I bring you greetings from the Colorado chapter of the American Indian Movement of which I've been a part since a lot of people in this room were still an aspiration rather than a reality. It's getting to be an old guy. Mm -hmm. Either that or y'all are getting younger, one or the other. But I also bring you greetings from Gwarthi Las, otherwise known as Leonard Peltier, who tonight, as I speak to you, continues to sit in a cage in federal prison, not for anything that anyone, including even his prosecutor, has been prepared to say they actually know he did. Not at any point in the last 25 years has any federal official actually said that. Leonard sits in that cage as a symbol of the arbitrary ability of the federal government of the United States to repress the legitimate aspirations of liberation of Native peoples within its claimed boundaries. And note the emphasis there should be on claim. Difference between a claim and a reality, even when that reality gets inverted so that Native people are pressing claims against the usurper of their rights. But are those rights to the land? and to exercise responsibility with regard to the land. 
genuine sovereignty. Or you can keep ticking them off. Now, a certain thing happened today. I might repeat what Amy just said. A lot of things were said of import during the passage of the day. And that creates a situation that I've often encountered. I have in mind to give a certain talk, cover certain ground. And then when I get to an event, participate, listen, learn, the nature of what I think should be said tends to change. Now, fortunately, tonight, what it is that's changed during the course of the day fits in in a certain way to what it was I was going to say anyway. So it's the nature of a alteration to the sequence, maybe a, the emphasis to a certain extent, but not the substance, not overall. But there's one idea in particular I kind of like to start with because it fits in. I want to talk about a couple things that were said by elders and only that particular impact on me that leads to how I frame things, including the things that I'll be saying tonight. But at least Sprague, when he was talking, sort of described an aspiration that he had which was to invert a certain reality that exists today in Indian country overall. It doesn't much matter which people you want to use to showcase the phenomena. We have these camps, these immersion camps, where we're trying to re-inculcate the language to conversational fluency. And so kids go out, if they're lucky, they get an opportunity to go out for a couple weeks in the summer. And all that's spoken is Ojibwe or Creek or Lakota or Dine or whatever language you want to pick. Because even though there's a lot of speakers, a certain native language is still today, we're kind of in the final generation. And in some the last fluent conversational speaker died out generations ago, so it's a reconstruction project. He said his aspiration was, I want eventually to get to where we're having English camp in the summer, to give them some proficiency in that because they're so fluent in their own language it doesn't occur to them to speak another. Well, I agree with that. But I think we should start that now. Well, and not with native children. I think we ought to do it with fluent English speakers or those who imagine themselves are. So maybe they know what the words of their own language mean, whether they're pretending they mean something else all the time. And that will become more apparent why I'm saying that as we go along. So I said there were a couple things that particular impact on me earlier on, 30, 40 years ago. Well, I'll describe them both. One is sat with an elder by the name of Philip Deer. Lived in Okima, down in Oklahoma country, Indian territory, permanent Indian territory, as it was designated by the United States, not by Indians. Indians considered all territory to be permanent Indian territory once upon a time. You know, that is where we started before. We started finding that we had claims to land that we were no longer possession of. Somebody else had ownership. How that happened? Well, that's an interesting story. But one we really can't go through to any degree of thoroughness tonight. But I looked like I looked, which is not like I stepped off the nickel. We have a society that deals with racial phenotype. It comes out of so-called scientific racist movement of the 19th century. They measure your skull. They measure your cheekbones. They measure the width of your nose, the length of your nose, proportion it out. See if you had the right teeth. Check your earwax. Do micrometers on the coarsity of your hair. Yeah. 
I'm not making any of this up. You go Minnesota, go to White Earth, and they ran a team. One anthropologist, one eugenicist from the University of Minnesota when they were busily trying to relieve Indians of land. Indians that were really Indians, according to some definition that was concocted in a laboratory in Washington, D.C., had rights to certain acreages of land. So the point of the exercise was to scientifically define Indians out of existence. If you didn't have the right earwax, you did not have the right coarseness of hair, if you didn't have the right teeth, you were some admixture. And if it was the wrong admixture, you lost your land. Now that interesting little idea of blood quantum got established. The mechanism for defining Indianness, and even Indians have internalized, right? That's the science of race in the 19th century. It has nothing to do with Native tradition and how Native people identify themselves. Nonetheless, it's internalized. We have these dynamics common to colonize peoples everywhere. The specifics alter from place to place and time to time, but nonetheless, the self-cannibalization this destructive, internally destructive dynamic the colonial paradigm imposes upon the colonizer. And so I told Philip, you know, I really have difficulty conceiving what my position should be, how I should relate to anybody, native or non-native, because I'm really, by definitions that have been imposed, Neither. And what he said, and I've acted on ever since, is be who you are. Don't attempt to be who you're not. Don't pretend to have been raised or whatever in ways that you weren't. You understand things irrespective of these definitions. And because you were raised in the way you were, where you were, you have an ability to communicate what it is you understand from us to them who see themselves as being other than us in ways that we can't. But the rules are these. Always take the truth as you understand it. And always... When you're doing that, call what it is you see by its right name. Don't call it something else because you're concerned you're going to hurt somebody's feelings or because it would be defined as polite. Call it what it is. And that's the most respect you can give to people, is not to lie to them by altering the language to mean things that it doesn't mean. I'll be getting to a little of that tonight, the G word. You know, we got these initialed words now. Well, you know, he's flat out called Obama the N-word. You know what that word is? Why pretend that you don't? Can't be said. It's said all the time. It's jarring to people. Good. Jar them with it. Don't let somebody off the hook with in word. Not my word. Don't let somebody else put that in your face. Maybe I'll come back to that a little bit. So I might talk about Malcolm X a little bit. Seems like he must talk to Philip too. Got the same advice. So how about the G word? Anybody know what the G word is? Nobody knows what the G word is. Well, that's because you all just bandy the term like genocide around in your classes as a matter of discussion, and you're well-trained in its meaning sociologically, its origin, its legal definition. You really get that in your college education. You've been getting it since grade school, right? No. You know you haven't. Actually, University audience, I ask this question at every university, so I'm not singling 
at the institution in Marquette. Anybody in this university audience want to try to give definition sociologically or legally of the word genocide? Promise not to eat your liver if you're wrong. You're safe. This is a safe environment. Go for it. Give me all that education you've gotten. Yes, ma'am. When you say one culture wipes out another, how do you mean that? Okay. We've got another taker here, and you're not wrong. You're not complete, but you're not wrong. Okay, that's the best definition I've ever gotten. Marquette, pat yourself on the back. Somebody's teaching something coherent about that word which is legally prohibited from the discourse in Canada, which isn't too far from here, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a judge in Canada that says you deviate from a dictionary definition. This is a judge. There is a legal definition. It's ratified by Canada. But if you deviate from a dictionary, a secretory definition of eradicating gene pools, it's a criminal offense by virtue of being contempt of court in Canada. This guy was a law professor at McGill before he went on the bench. Yeah, so you're legally prohibited. I don't know the extent of enforcement. I say that word all the time. I don't care about the ruling. It was my testimony that he was rebutting, really. Okay? And throw me out of Canada or the northern provinces of the United States, as I call them, anytime they want. I'll go back whenever I can. And I'll do exactly what I do. But down here, it's just not uttered. It's not legally prohibited. They just dump it in the trash can like Lynn Cheney did for the quincentennial celebration. Any proposal for educational effort attending the Columbian quincentenary back in 92 or during the run-up, 1990 and 91, when the proposals, the sponsors of the RFPs came in, if it had the word genocide, it went summarily in the trash can. They didn't even read it. Now, the interesting thing with that is you had some uh, proposals there to prove it wasn't about genocide. And they went in the trash can, too, because they used the word. You just don't use it. That's why we call it the G word. But we had somebody else here going to, yeah. Yeah. It's an English language usage, so you have to understand the English language doesn't contain much English mostly stuff appropriated, and this is appropriate, this appropriation, appropriating words from every other language that's convenient, calling it English. Okay, that's Latin, one part Latin, one part Greek, is it not? Yeah. But were you going to go any further with that? Okay. You've got an academic industry in this country to make that go away. It has a definition which we'll come to. All right? But you have to take a specialized course, native studies, to find out that anything that would meet that definition occurred at any point in the last 500 years in North America. Well, we'll concede that there were some tragedies, some inadvertencies, best of intentions went awry. There was even ethnocide. There was a new and ethnic cleansing. You got a really good book on the history of Texas that just came out. But in the last, I don't know, three years, a guy by the name of Anderson wrote a book called Conquest of Texas that is just chapter and verse on what was done, extermination campaigns, one right after another. And 
I'm not using that term to describe them. That's what Lamar and Austin and Baylor. Anybody watch Baylor football? Lamar University, Baylor University. They've gone for outright extermination. Exterminate the Indians within the confines of Texas. And they meant that in literal terms. But in documenting all this in wonderful fashion, if you can call such a history wonderful, because he really gets it down, he explains, as a caveat going in, that despite the horrors he's going to describe, the unrelenting drive to extermination, he's not sure it rises to the level of genocide. Therefore, he's going to designate it to having been ethnic cleansing. Anything but what it was. Make up words, euphemism, convolution. We will all condemn genocide by virtue of defining everything we did as being something else. Or even if we can't define it as being something else, just calling it something else, package and spin and pretend and deny. So you got a bunch of Holocaust deniers out there, the neo-Nazi variety that deny that big H Holocaust that the Nazis perpetrated against, well, it really wasn't just Jews, but it's also something about the uh, Roma. There was something about the Slavs. There was something about they ran out of time before they ran out of intended victims. They had old population sectors designated for eradication. But they certainly did what they did to the Jews and to the Gypsies and to a chunk of the Slavs. So you got people that would deny that, and they're called a lunatic fringe, and they're reviled and they're disparaged. But here it's a mainstream industry to do exactly the same thing with regard to indigenous people. Okay. So call things by the right name. You get right up in the face of people who try to call them something else. Because you don't have an international legal convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of ethnocide. You don't even have it for ethnic cleansing. You've got criminal categories that may bear on this, but genocide is the crime. It was called the incomparable crime. So we couldn't be guilty of that. We'll just redefine the crime in such a way as we can exempt ourselves. All right, Philip. The other one, and there's plenty more people I could cite. I could stand here and quote elders and tell you why these things had impact on me all night long, but two for purposes of the talk. The other one, interesting old guy, interesting by virtue of the fact that his name is Master Keeney. He's Lakota, Ogala Lakota, the assistant to Fool's Pro, who was the last really traditional head man of the Ogala Lakota. That's Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Well, you won't find anything signed by Matthew Matthews, who signed everything, Noble Red Man. Noble Red Man has signed many official documents, and he has given interviews and so forth. And he says, well, they talk about the Noble Red Man, only one. I have a fairly high regard for myself, so they must be talking about me. So that's the name they want me to use, and therefore I will. And did so ever. Yeah, kind of a wicked witch. He was one of the suggested to fool Stroll when they offered the Black Hills land sum of $17.5 million originally for the richest 100 square miles mineral wise on the planet, from which the home stake mine alone had extracted at that time something on the order of $14 billion worth of gold. They said, well, we forgot to pay you when we illegally took your land. So here, here's a, what we value the land of being when we took it 100 odd years ago, $17.5 million. Their response was, what makes this money you're offering is worth anything? And that's what it plummets the feds who are making the offer. And then Matthew pipes up. Fool Stroh had asked this, and he says, it's backed by gold, isn't it? And he says, yeah. They've 
gold reserves, and that sort of assures a base value to the currency. And started off into the Harvard economist explanation of how that works. And I said, well, where is that gold? Makes this money worth something. Fort Knox, isn't it? And they had the wild, yeah. So where did you get it? Didn't come from that mine up there at Deadwood, did it? Home State. Well, some of it probably did. So let me see if I got this straight. You come out here and slaughter the buffalo and slaughter the people and force us into these concentration camps where we're starving to death so you can dig that gold out of the ground and then you haul it halfway across the country and you bury it again at Fort Knox. And then you want to take some piece of that that you say is of value and give it back to me in exchange for my land? You must think I'm crazy. That's exactly the truth of the matter. Well, we kind of revered Matthew, American Indian movement. Back in the early 80s, we decided to practice white man law. In 1877, they came in and violated the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which reserved in perpetuity about 5% of the 48 contiguous states of the United States, one block of land beginning on the east bank of the Missouri River, proceeding west. Note the east bank means the Missouri River is inside the 1868 Treaty of Territory. In fact, it's inside the Great Sioux Reservation as the U.S. subdivided that, all the way to the Bighorn Mountains and all the way from the beyond the bend of the Missouri in the north down to the North Platte River in Nebraska. That is a humongous chunk of territory. 1877, they came in, having fought that campaign where Custer got his Atlantic lesson, mostly a winter campaign that Randall McKenzie ran on. People had stood down. They had them dismounted. They had them disarmed, totally dependent for rations in 1877. That's a year after the military conflict. They suspended the rations and said, when you sign this piece of paper conveying title, legal title, they called it, to the Black Hills girls, you can eat again. Never did get a sufficient number of signatures to legally transfer title. But that's the way it was done. Well, what they did was they took the hills. They took the Black Hills. They took the so-called unceded Indian territory. They took the hunting land down in Nebraska, and they took about 90% of the Great Sioux Reservation for the Homestead Act to the General Allotment Act. You want to play with white law, some of us know it, know what a subterfuge is. That's a very complicated, by virtue of all the conflicting statutory and regulatory structures that they built to mystify people as to what their rights are and are not. But here's the bottom line. They took it and then they created law to cast appearance of legitimacy over the taking. That's what I mean by white man law. So American Indian Movement, Dakota, decided to practice some of that law in 1981. We went to a site that was selected on the basis they were going to turn it into a gravel quarry, about 800 acres. Oh, 15 miles or a little less outside Rapid City. Those of you familiar with the geography down there, we're on the hillside, 15 miles out of Rapid City. A little bit to the south, to the west of the city itself. We took the land. We held it. It's the longest sustained occupation as the feds have defined occupations. They call it the return to the hills. Probably in the 20th century. Went five years of continuous occupation before that was over. But the idea is, okay, we can spend another three generations, which the Lakota people had collectively done at that point, trying to recover the hills and force their legal rights. So we can just do what they did, which is go and take it, and then we'll go to court. We did. 
physically in possession of it, and guess what? They won. They understand their own law when it comes at them. They've got nullified. It's means V-U-S 1983. You can look it up, case, as far as it went. It was a matter of record. We won it. We were talking about sacred sites today. This is the first and only judicial decision in the United States that determined that sacredness not, does not necessarily inherit only in a site, a specific location, with or without a structure. We didn't even have that argument. Okay, the entire region was sacred. That was the argument put forth. Wahasapa, the entire Black Hills is sacred locale. That's the center of the universe of the Lakota. Okay. Judge Hill had the right. So this was nullified by the Go Road decision. Link v. Northwest California Cemetery Protective Association, I think that was technically. They decided to respect the interests of a lumber logging corporation to cut a road through it, outweighed the right of people to maintain the sanctity of a central sacred valley used by three different people from Northern California around Mount Shasta. Burial grounds and a whole lot. Okay. Greater interest in hearing in the possibility that somebody might want to log it sometime, so you just cut a road right through the middle of it. Sorry, but for religious rights. We were talking about the uh, American Indian Freedom of Religion Act. Indians were made citizens whether they wanted to be or not in 1924, 1978. They finally get around to expecting an act that said Indians have religious rights. I thought all citizens had religious rights. Oh, yeah, they're citizens and then there's Indians. And they may be citizens in a technical sense, but take special legislation to ensure that they're acknowledged as having rights at all. Okay. So in the middle of the Yellow Thunder occupation, maintain com contact communication with the people. So we take instruction from the elders directly. And this is not a figurative sense. Bull Straw was a militant. He was 85 years old. But that didn't temper it a bit. All right? Matthew was three years younger than him. And he was even feistier. They'd come out to the camp. But that's a little bit of a burden when you're 85 years old to be tromping around in vertical inclines. So we go out in that pine ridge. We needed to talk to the community anyway. Security crews would go out. Stop the old people's houses, see what needed doing, and do it. I thought this was a transmitter for a microphone and it's playing music for me out of my pocket. Goodness. Where was it? Pine Ridge? Yeah. We talked to Matthews. And we brought some wood and then got some water for the stock. And then went and sat under the arbor, which is customary. Somebody also mentioned today that anytime you visit someone, you're going to eat. If you're in the traditional Indian community. Makes organizing for things like voter drives on a reservation a really rugged experience. Unless you can eat 14 times a day. Because it's impolite if you don't. But if you really can't, you got to at least drink coffee. So we'd be drinking coffee. This is late July in South Dakota. It was about 105 under the arbor, but we're drinking coffee. Okay. And smoking our cigarettes. And chatting and then just sort of cleared his throat, which is a key sign he's got something that he actually wants you to listen to. It's not just banter anymore. And so we all shut up. And he started out by telling us how much he admired it, which was an interesting experience because Matthew was kind of an icon to the American Indian movement in South Dakota at that time. And he's talking to us just straight up and saying, I really admire you, boy. You still got the fire in your belly. You go to toe-to-toe -to -toe against ridiculous odds, which is true enough, but that was the basic responsibility as was understood at the time. But he was leading somewhere, 
Nobody say anything. We'll just kind of look at each other because these are not the kind of compliments you tend to get gratuitously. What's he going to say? He said, but you see, you're beat before you start. Well, that caught attention. I mean, we had about 70 dead at that point in this little counterinsurgency campaign that the feds had run in Pine Ridge during the preceding decade. Admires our courage, but we're beat before we start. So he just sat there for a couple minutes and let that sink in. And he said, see, the thing is, you don't know your history. If you don't know your history, you don't know what you're up against. And that causes you to make mistakes. But worse, since you don't know what you're up against, by virtue of not knowing your history, you don't really know where you are either. And since you don't know where you are, you don't know where it is you're trying to go. You're just struggling against something. You're struggling hard. You're paying dues for it. I didn't say that. I'm just encapsulating the gist of it. But no matter how hard you struggle, if you don't know certain things, you're going to lose. He said, liken it to making a trip across these plains out here. Now, this is really different terrain up here. And I don't know how you'd apply this to the ocean. Because it's kind of like being on the ocean. Some areas of Great Plains. You can get completely disoriented out there. It's pool table flat. Yeah, Indians. Read the stars. Navigate that way. Tell by the sun. What happens if it's a cloudy day? You just sit down and wait for the sun and the stars to come back, or it's not very efficient. That was his point. Even when the sun's out, it's a sure thing to every once in a while there's something pops up in the plains. There's a butte. There's a big tree. There's something. And since it's so flat, you can see it for a while. You can see it coming, and you can see it going. If you know where you're trying to get to, you pass that marker, you look back every once in a while, see where you are in relationship. That fixes your current space, and that allows you to set the direction to get where it is you want to go. Well, that's your history. If you don't really understand your history, if you don't know what happened, if you don't pay attention to it, you can't really understand where it is you find yourself at a given moment. And even if it's really, really uncomfortable, you don't know where you need to head off to in order to actually fix it. You can change it, maybe. But that's not necessarily going to work out for the better. It's possible to change things for the worse. He was trying to impress upon us the need for historical understanding. And rather than just discussing issues and floundering around and fighting about them, okay, to figure out what the nature of the enemy we were actually up against was. You can figure out how to beat them much more effectively that way. But more importantly, you can figure out what it is you're fighting for rather than just what you're fighting against in the immediate sense. No one hearing much of that today. It was because perhaps time was limited. But it was the immediacy of situation. We were circling a rock in a way all day long as if what we were up against was all new and different. How do we go about fighting it? Well, we've fought it before. We've been fighting it for a while. And certain things worked and certain things didn't. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time an issue pops up. I have a little historical contextualization. It really saves a lot of time and energy and error. I've taken that to heart, too. Because he was dead on target. 
And usually right is the little goal story will indicate, although he, he tended to put it with, a, like I said, with really wicked humor. He'd ridicule bureaucrats who were absolutely full of themselves and the sanctity of their position and the toning law, and he'd just take them apart this way. And he did understand his history. Lots better than a lot of history professors I've encountered, and he never called things by the wrong name. He may not have had five syllables for the descriptor, but he's called things by the right name anyway. So what I'm supposed to be talking about here, this is the framing of it, are a couple of processes that tend to be treated discreetly. we got people who are environmental activists here. I've been interacting with them all day. People who are quantified activists and students who are at least interested enough in the issues related to the environment to sign up for courses. So they were coming in and out of here. And if I toss the word ecology or ecocide, one derived from the other, on a table, I plug in a response. People, more than one, get a shot and an answer. And the answers would probably be as coherent as the one response to genocide. But it's ecocide. So not a lot of time spent dealing with the issue of genocide. And on the other hand, if you're taking courses from a genocide scholar, you probably won't be hearing much about ecocide. But I will submit that they're inseparable processes and that they have a common origin, lead to a common result. You may have noticed a completely different word in the title for the talk, and that was omnicide. Well, omnicide is a fairly simple concept in a way, and that's if you take those two supposedly discrete terms of holocaustal attitude and conduct, right, genocide and ecocide taken in combination give you an omnicidal result. The result of that is virtually eradication of habitable space for species. Of course, if you eradicate habitable space for this particular species you're part of, that's going to take out a lot of other species as well because most forms of mammalian life depend on essentially the same sets of environmental factors for survivability that humans do. And that would take most birds as well. And I put water as life because both birds and mammals and everything else that's organic depends first and foremost on water. And if water is going to be one of the keys to eradication of mammalian species, it's also going to take out aquatic life. You know, this is not unprecedented. Humans certainly are not indispensable to the planet. The planet has existed for a few billion years in Western chronology. We could say that it was permanent in most native cosmology. But billions of years in human terms is permanent anyway, so I suggest we just forget that particular little differentiation. Humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, well, the anthros, the people, paleontologists and others who deal with that, tell you it's been 40 to 80,000 years. That's the entire interval of existence. Now, I might argue that it's been a little longer than that, but even if we took the most extreme argument I wanted to make, snap of the fingers in geological time. Before humans, there were some mammals running around, but there's a prehistory to mammals, too. I mean, we do have the age of the, age of the dinosaurs, did we not? I'm not going to suggest that uh, omnicidal comportment that will be discussed here is going to bring the dinosaurs back. No. But the world will go on. How about the age of the cockroach? Various forms of insect life being the reigning range of species. Yeah, the planet's still here. Life forms continue. A balance will be reestablished. It just doesn't require our presence. 
either in literal or figurative form. Planet's going to outlast us, but the question is what particular state the planet's going to outlast us. When we were saying slides of the Milky Way, we didn't figure this was the only planet in an entire galaxy that was sustaining life forms as we know them, did you? They're going on completely independent. Either of us, or in those vaunted scientific terms, given our knowledge, they finally found one. Another planet, that is. Let me reframe that. A planet that's not rotating around this particular star. So they say. Atmospheric temperature of uh, 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds of something like 4,300 miles an hour, and it rains iron in molten form. Are there life forms there? Please me. In a place I want to move. Okay. But if where there's one planet, there's probably more. They have never known until very recently that there were any planets outside of this solar system. You could speculate. You could get Cole von Dynamon for it. Or someone who's susceptible to maybe superstition. Yeah. Let's pop things up on a bigger screen. It was being discussed today. We're talking really good talk, too. About the condition of Lake Superior. I'd only make one quibble with all, everything that was said today. It was accurate and dead on. We're talking about 20% of the world's fresh water. It's not fresh. In fact, you consume it at your peril. It's laced with mercury, laced with a dozen other highly toxic substances that cause nerve and brain damage. Fresh water is one you can dip your cup in and drink. Great Slave Lake is still fresh water. Yukon River is still fresh water. None of the heart of North America, the so-called Great Lakes, are fresh water at all. Superior is probably in the best condition of the five. And if you drink it straight out of the lake, you're full. If you drink, if you consume the aquatic life that's taken from the lake, some people have no choice. But if you do it by choice, you're a fool. Mercury is unforgiving, especially on young people. And that's something that has to be contended with. Well, I said we pop up on a bigger board. They have a plan. They've always got a plan. It was also mentioned that there's this Western belief that the solution to the problems created by technology is technology. You could make that case, no argument there, but you could extrapolate a little further. The solution to the problems engendered by scientific mindset is more science. What are those solutions? We don't know. The science will figure it out. Let's see. You've got a problem. You don't know what the answer is, but you've got faith that there's going to be an answer forthcoming from a particular codification of knowledge, that's not science, that's religion. Those are supposed to be antipodes in Western tradition. Okay? Science, the subjective attainment of knowledge, has supplanted religion in the West, or so the West will tell you proudly. Scientific knowledge is the not Excuse me. It's not knowledge. You don't know what the answer is. You make a signification of faith that there will be an answer forthcoming by virtue of scientific application of reason? That is religion. All you've done is supplant one religion with another. And claiming that the opposite is true. And since the opposite that is falsely claimed is supposedly true, it's superior to all other forms of knowledge. Yo. Have I heard this one somewhere before? Something about the Lutheran mental and the teaching of the true God? 
stand here and read a edict in Spanish to a bunch of indigenous people on the southern border of Mexico, give them to sundown, profess fealty to the king in the name of the Holy See, and embrace the true God, and if not, you shall be put to death tonight. We've heard this before. But what's their fix? Well, somebody scoffed at in a great scholarly journal. Oh, no, I can't be scoffed at in the Rocky Mountain News anymore because it went out of business. I forgot I had the great celebratory moment of watching them go down the tube like a sword. Yeah, you know what my image here was. Okay. Yeah, it was accurate. Now, WAPA, North American Water and Power Alliance. Anybody ever heard of it? The plan started in the 1970s when Ottawa contracted with an engineering firm in Los Angeles, California, to create a system that would take something like a trillion acre feet per year. I don't remember the precise number. Humongous number of acre feet from the Yukon River diverted south, basically through a plumbing system. Great Bear Lake to Great Slave Lake. Great Slave Lake to Lesser Slave Lake. Lesser Slave Lake to Lake Winnipeg. At which point we will channel the flow in two directions. Half will be apportioned to run down through the Columbia River Basin and then be through a whole series of steps and river basins southward used to irrigate Sonoran Desert in northern Mexico for cheap food supplies. Okay, the other half is to go into the west end of Lake Superior, flushing the Great Lakes as a whole outward into the Atlantic Ocean, thereby solving the problem of latent toxin buildup in industrial usage. Now, I don't know what the Atlantic Ocean is supposed to do with this mercury and stuff either. It's got whole dead zones in it already, too. But that's the fix. It's going to just reorganize the plumbing of an entire continent. If you think about how they draw the maps of North America, yeah, actually, geographically, it runs down to Central America. But that's not how they draw the maps. That's not how they do the demography. Yeah, there's a little political calculation, okay? Indigenous population circa 1500 is done for demographic estimation purposes from well, whose colonial language you want to use here? From the Rio Grande North or from the Rio Bravo North? If it's south of the border, you call it the Rio Bravo. If it's north of the border, you call it the Rio Grande. I don't know what the big deal is because they're both Spanish. And neither of those terms are indigenous. But <coughs> we take pride in colonial languages sometimes. That's the Chicano. That's a liberatory language. In some ways, in an agro low phone society, I suppose maybe it is to a certain extent. But yeah, if you actually follow the political reasoning and make the point of demarcation at the Mexican border, everything south is supposedly Latin, although they, you'd never know that in British Honduras, now known as Belize, okay, or the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, but that's minor, okay? The English-speaking north is the North American continent. Well, you're going from the north slope of Alaska all the way down into the Sonora Desert below the Mexican border. So that's fully continental scale. What's the impact and the effect of rerouting the aquatic systems of an entire continent on the continent itself? What happens to the biospheres? And we can come east. Different set of problems having to do with hydroelectricity generation, but they want to reroute whole rivers so they run backwards into James Bay. Now, now Wapa, that was a pipe dream. They suspended that long ago. Well, the piece that out they were laughing about was 1988. They had suspended it in the early 1980s, but they revived it in 1988. 
And then they decided it was cost prohibitive, so they shelved it again. However, the Nawapa plan called for X number of dams. They built 31 of them. All right? A lot of them don't have any particular utility other than for completing that project. 31 are built. They haven't torn them down. They're still there. That thing's ready to go and partially completed. But we don't need to worry about it because what? It's sitting on a shelf in some government office in Ottawa waiting for the need calculation to change, the cost-benefit ratio to change, partially completed. They don't even have to start from ground zero. The same with the James Bay project, and we're not talking Great Whale. That was a separate project. Now we're running all the way over into Manitoba, rivers running backwards and so forth, in order to fulfill someone's scheme of what development should look like. And that's what I mean about using words in strange ways. How do you develop a mountain? I'm a professional developer. Yo, what do you develop? Well, I'm going to develop that field. Well, that field's already developed. See, it didn't start out being a field. So even in terms you're using, which is, means the subject of human intervention and transformation from what it started out being into being something else, that's development. It's been developed. So you're going to redevelop it. What are you going to do? Develop it into a parking lot? It'll be gone forever. Development sounds kind of cool. I'm going to develop it. Well, it's called by the tribe name. You're going to develop a mountain by converting it into gravel so it can be used as ballast in a railroad bed or matrix for constructing buildings. You're going to cut it into slabs and use it as a building phase. When you're done developing the mountain, the mountain's no longer there. It's been destroyed. How about you call it by its right name? I'm a professional destroyer. I destroy the environment day in, day out, relentlessly. There will be no piece of the environment left intact. Okay, you can have no unused chunk of territory. By God, if nothing else, I'll turn it into another golf course. You can't have too many guys out there on Saturday afternoon putting chronically for our kids. For our kids. It's our quality of life. What, to go out and bang a ball around in an artificial turf with a stick? That's your idea of quality of life, is it? Oh, sorry about your grandparents' graves, but we needed another three holes in the golf course. Why are you so upset? You're taking our bridge. Now you're being violent. We told you it was a graveyard. Yeah, but greater good. There's more of us, and we need to play golf. Richard Brennan, I believe it was, in Facing West, does a really beautiful, eloquent passage in the early chapters where he talks about the Pilgrim Fathers landing on the West Coast, excuse me, on the East Coast. Hard to tell East from West on a steer, isn't it? Lay it out there flat on a map and it all makes perfect sense, but, you know, Eastern religions, you approach by going West. In fact, Europe learned the knowledge of the East from the West because the Moors were in Spain. That's what, oh, never mind. The Atlantic coast, let's put it that way, of North America, and then proceeding to march themselves to where they encountered the first of the Great Lakes. And as they're going, they're felling trees. I mean, they just can't stand those trees. They, after all, are going to create New England. And in England, after all, they had already consumed every living oak tree to make naval vessels and merchant vessels and to build fortifications to protect themselves from one another. Trees just don't look like England. Knock them down. Besides, you've got the Norman yoke to contend with. You can't profess ownership of property unless you transform it from a state of nature to a state of domestication. And the surest way you can demonstrate the fact that you've done that is to knock down the trees and turn them into something else. And as they cut down trees, they're cutting down Indians at the same time. They're subduing the wilderness, which really wasn't the wilderness at that time. It had been basically 
put into an interactive relation with humans long since. It was not in a virginal state, as if uninhabited by humans. Humans had had their impact. They just not have an impact in a way that could not be sustained over long periods of time. Very different proposition. But if it's not been knocked down and fenced in and converted into a simulation of the English countryside, it's raw and evil wilderness. And the people who inhabit it and are comfortable in it are evidence of the same evil that is embodied in the wilderness. And civilization, which actually means to live in cities, cannot take hold. Well, excuse me. Anybody ever heard of Cortez and Tenochtitlan? Which is now known as Mexico City. Or Mexica, which is what the Aztecs called themselves. They're the third largest city on the planet. If civilization means to live in cities, then you had a far more civilized society in Mesoamerica at the time than you had in all of Iberia. Actually, if you took the top three cities of Iberia and combined them into one, they couldn't have equaled Tenochtitlan. And they're talking about the Aztec barbarians and the civilized Spaniards. And the Aztecs were barbarians, they said, because they did human sacrifice. A matter, I might point out, for which there is no eyewitness evidence whatsoever. Spaniards reported it, and that really comes down to one guy that is recorded in Bernal Diaz as having said he witnessed a sacrifice atop a pyramid from a distance of three miles with a naked eye. You want to try that one sometime? For all he knew, they were doing dope on top of that pyramid. You couldn't, lucky you could tell there was anybody up there at all from that distance. I've defied recalcitrant students. Oh, I get to use that word. Recalcitrant. They always call them Indians recalcitrants. Recalcitrant students. Force them to go to the top of the University Memorial Center, stand there and Tell me what was going on in Main Street, Louisville, which is about three miles out. They couldn't even tell me what kind of cars they were. Never mind whether someone was doing knife work in somebody else's chest. And that's the sole Spanish account of human sacrifice. But even assuming the Aztecs were doing that, what were they doing in Spain at the same time? Something about Inquisition. Something about lining the roads with people broken on wheels. Well, I'll visit the torture museum sometime. I'll give you a real rush. The pride of civilization is the extended stuff of saws that would cut bodies in two. I mean, it's the only purpose they have. You wouldn't believe the stuff that would be coming up here. And they're worried about the Aztecs being uncivilized by any possible definition. If that's to be your indicator, then the superior culture was the one that was sacked by the, I guess, barbarian hordes. Yeah. Well, the whole story was kind of like Pac-Man. Do you remember that game, or is, am I showing my age here? Okay. Pac-Man ate everything? Yeah. Basically, Pac-Man arrived and ate across the continent. I used to call that the arrival of predators, and then I realized predators aren't bad. This is an insult to predators to consider the arrival of these Pac-Man creatures. That create, I guess, civilizations, what I have to call something like Los Angeles, for example. In satellite photography, you take a infrared photograph of Los Angeles and juxtapose it to sliced film photograph by a section of a tumor, and it's structurally identical. What does this mean? Dot, dot, dot. Draw your own conclusions from that one. Where does the mentality, since it doesn't take, really, a Ph.D. to figure out you're dependent on the habitat for survival itself. Absent the environment and the maintenance of the environment in a working order, you're dead. Unless you like James Watt, you want to cut down all the redwoods because, after all, the end game is coming within two months. So you better use it now because it won't be around. The rapture is upon us.
What do you call somebody? What is that? Picture of mental health? Notice, I'm not giving the moral judgments on this. It's just you don't really think someone who deliberately self-destructs is being particularly well-balanced individual. I don't believe you're going to some fiery lake or any of the rest of that. And sometimes that's probably the better option you can have for the choices available. I want to be clear. But this is not something that a normal, sane, healthy human being is going to opt to do, and yet you get an entire culture that's insisting upon it. You could say the self-anointed superior society is self-evidently psychopathic to its core in a really, really self-destructive way. Where would this come from? I mean, I can look around and see over the sweep of history, say for the last thousand years, several thousand discernible cultures, and I'm not intimately familiar with them all, but there's a cluster, there's a cluster which we take as the benchmark, which are completely out of whack with all the rest, and we take it as a signifier of superiority, which I think Hannibal Lecter did, did he not? Oh yeah, and he was cool, very charming, urbane, obviously brilliant. Very, very well-educated, well-versed in literature, the arts, human psychology, philosophy. Fine chef, I'm told, as well. Sit down and have a meal, and you'll be it. Psychopathic culture? Well... It's a controversial term, says the psychopathic culture. Being a little less honest than Lecter, who, of course, referred to himself as subject to a pathology a thousand times more virulent than any of us are on record in the clinical literature. This is clinical literature. But what was it that would cause something had to have happened? I mean, is it genetic, do you think? Are people who define themselves and pride themselves on being of the European tradition, European, excuse me, let me mispronounce your name the way Europeans usually mispronounce ours. One good compliment deserves another. It's no big deal after all. You can't be expected to pronounce these polysyllabic words. There's more than two syllables in European, so on. Okay. You sound like a comfortable with nature? You strive to transform? I mean, you've heard that yuppie saying, have you not? He who dies with most toys wins. Porsche Lamborghini, house swimming pools, huh? Okay. Look at my wardrobe. I've never worn the same pair of socks twice in the last 14 years. And that's proof of my superiority. You can find prefiguration of that in really, really militant Christianity, say the uh, Puritans. Wasn't that what Cotton Mather was on about? Toil and godliness, the Puritan ethic, the labor. Well, what are you laboring on? Manual labor in the fields, transforming nature from a state of wilderness to domestication. What's this on about? We had some ambiguity about Christianity today. Now, before I even get into this, let me see. How is it that old fellow? Some of my best friends are Christian. I had one over to dinner one night. You got any Christians in here? Right on. We got way more than that, but right on to those of you who 
figured you were getting set up to zone it. And I, I really won't set you up. I'll give you a little test. Is that fair? Okay. Are you Christian enough that you've read the first page of the Bible? We're not going to do some Bible study scores here, right? We're just going to be a little first page. You with me? You've done that part. Remember that part where it said that uh, man's created in the image of God? Hmm. Man's created in the image of God. So that means God must look like a man, huh? If you're created in his image, then you must look like him. Therefore, he must look like you. Of course, he's been around a while longer than you from the looks of things. He's got a long white beard. And you know the image that I'm talking about. Well, it's consistent with, yeah? Does it say anything in there about anything else being the image of God? Hmm. Does it say something about uh, since you're in the image of God, you have not only a responsibility but a right, or not only a right but a responsibility, excuse me, I had that one backwards to, uh, I'm paraphrasing, exercise dominion over, he's nodding yes, I didn't have to finish it, so, yeah, and dominion is exercised by God, but you can't create. That's a given. The world was already created. Right? So you manifest you're sort of God in the world. Since you're in the image of God, you're going to exercise dominion over what's already here. How do you demonstrate dominion? You transform. Why do you have to transform? Because you have this task assigned you to multiply, grow plentiful, and populate the earth. Do you not? How do you do that without displacing what was already here? It's all right there, isn't it? You're enjoined, God-like, separated from nature, to act upon nature, to exercise dominion over it, to rearrange it in order to accommodate more and more of yourself because that's a signifier of godliness. Well, that part still takes us to pot and mather, and that takes us to the Russians. That takes us to back man. That takes us to, that takes us right there. But that's not a comfortability manifested with nature. That's a profound degree of alienation from nature. You're separated from all other relations, right then and there. You stand apart from the rest of the natural order of living relations and above it. You are to it's subordinate to you, and you subjugate it, demonstrate your humanity, that is to say your godliness, in that fashion. That's the enjoyer on the very first page of the book. Where did that come from? I don't see that anywhere else. Did you? Right. Actually, I do see it. Let me not lie to you. Everything else is based upon that book, which is not a Christian book. It's a Judaic book. So that's why you get that Judeo-Christian. But, hey, there's another guy that based his book on it, too. So now you're going to have to add Islam in. Islam has a somewhat different cat, but it's coming on the very same source book. Uh, defining the relationship of humanity to the natural world as being separate from it. And if you've got that kind of alienation, you're going to act in a certain way. That's why I was kind of squirming. People told me, well, I really respect Christians. I may respect people, but if tradition goes in that direction, how do you respect it? It's obliged as a spiritual proposition to eradicate you and everything you depend upon to sustain yourself and to sustain itself in the end once it runs out of you. How do you transcend that? I don't know. But where did it come from? What went wrong? That's the question I was being asked in the universities. 
Where did Native people come up with these strange animistic beliefs that they're related to trees and animals? That's what you hear. Those are the questions posed. Let's study those cultures closely and see if there isn't some sort of a link that can be drawn between the twistedness and primitiveness of indigenous belief systems, spiritual traditions, and so forth on the one hand, and acute and chronic alcoholism on the other. Well, actually, there is a relationship between those two. If you're actually looking for a viable habitat to pass along to your posterity seven generations in the future, you have the responsibility to maintain the habitat in a condition where you can pass it along in a viable condition. And you're prevented by things like individuated property ownership and the notion that there's a greater good and speculative road thing than to practice spiritual traditions. Things like that might drive you to drink. If the boarding schools hadn't done it, the residential schools, as they're called, you know, there's concrete reasons they're probably not tied up in feeling themselves to be a part of responsible to nature. Okay. We'll move fast. And the last chunk, because I assume it's somewhat better known, but I also have to remember that G word. We've got a sort of a natural inclination to ecocide that's built into the matrix of understanding place in the world or separateness of place from world, however you want to frame that, been in the centerpiece of Western belief. And science did nothing but secularize that, by the way. We can go into that in Q&A if you like. Same beliefs, core beliefs. Karl Marx is the best Christian of his generation. And I'll explain that too if anybody wants it. I'll also explain Groucho Marx, if you like that. Okay. What's genocide mean? Well, I've got a general answer that was right on target, but let me run it to you this way. Lots of ways I can go at it. But this is a... No, how did it actually occur? Marbury, Chief Justice Marshall, U.S. Supreme Court, 1803. So, bedrock jurisprudence in the United States, this is a government of laws, not men. Usually, quoted a little bit wrongly, as being a nation of laws, not men. And you know, there's a law for everything. 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 You have to do, or you can't do it. But if you're going to do it, here's how you're going to do it. And we'll even sometimes codify why you're going to do it. Land of the free, most regimented people on the planet, under simple proliferation of statute and regulation. Well, here's the legal definition of genocide. 1948 Convention, Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, ratified by the United States, last of all major states on the planet. Oh, by the way, that entity that everybody's complaining about today, it's a misnomer. The United Nations should have been called the United States. You have to be a state, a recognized state entity to be eligible for membership. But, you know, the name was already taken. So they conflated nation and state. There's 4,000 odd nations on the planet. There's 200 states. But you've got to be a state to be a part of that little enterprise. In any case, United States state, central government, that is, finally ratified the thing with several self-exempting provisions 40 years after the rest of the planet, basically. Article 2. The genocide is defined as being any of the following actions undertaken with intent to destroy in whole or in part a racial, ethnical, national, or religious group as such. Not the individuals, but the group. The groups at issue. Okay? Lincoln's original definition of it, and he was the drafter of this, was any policy undertaken with intent to bring about the dissolution and disappearance of the human group as such. 
Well, we got four protected classes. There should be more. But they elucidate four. They're listed. Racial, ethnical, national, religious. Indigenous people qualify as all four. We don't understand ourselves as a race, or we didn't until that was imposed with blood quantum and such. These are not native traditions. These are Western so-called scientific traditions that are imposed. They've been internalized, used in a very self-destructive, eternally destabilizing manner by officially sanctioned tribal governments and others ever since. Nonetheless, by the definition imposed by the perpetrator, we are understood to be a racial group. There are also ethnic groups because we're culturally dissimilar, distinguishable one group from another on cultural basis. That's the operant definition of ethnicity. We clearly have religions, as they say, spiritual traditions and so forth, which have been prohibited under federal law with criminal penalties attached. Okay, that makes it clear. The target is a religious group. National group, we've got 400 odd ratified treaties, and there are 400 unratified treaties under the, uh, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. That means we have to be understood to be recognized nations. Otherwise, all the treaties are invalid, and if all the treaties are invalid, the United States has no discernible land title anywhere beyond the 13 original colonies. You with me so far? Okay. So we're clearly in a list of protected classes. There's four protected classes, we're in all four. There's five criteria of policy listed. Killing members of the group. Well, that one's pretty straightforward. Everybody knows about that, pretty much, except that it didn't say how many. There's no threshold on that to rise to. Remember I was talking about the guy that disqualified what well, happened in Texas as being genocide didn't rise to that level? If you were killing Indians on basis of their being Indians, that's a genocidal policy, period. doesn't require X number of that proportion. There's nothing in the law that says that. And if you go back to Lincoln's original definition, he's real clear that that wouldn't be applicable anyway. If you're killing them simply by, on the basis of who they are, it doesn't matter how many you kill. That's genocidal killing. In the United States, they like to call it a hate crime, another euphemism. If you're killing on this basis, it's genocide. Because it's one of the protected classes. Gay people ought to be in a protected class, too, but they're not in law. Now, we should revise the law and expand the protected classes. I would be in favor of it. But as far as Indians are concerned, if Indians are being killed on the basis of being Indian, that's genocidal comportment. Okay? i got two words for anybody who wants to be a skeptic as to whether that would be applicable all over the place in the United States, and those two words are scout bounties. Every single... U.S. state and territory at one or time or several had in place an official policy of paying for proof of death of American Indians. didn't matter what Indian. We will pay you a price for proof of death in the form of scalp or bloody red skin. Oh, anybody thought the Washington Redskins was just a, a racial slur on melanin content? No. This is Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs skinning people to prove he killed them, making garments, tanning the skins, wearing them. Every single section of the 48 contiguous states had a scout bounty, sometimes more than once. Kill an Indian, get paid for it. Doesn't matter what Indian, kill an Indian, Indian, Indian. That's as genocidal policy as is possible to conceive on the basis of killing. But killing because they try to make that one a synonym. A mode of killing, particularly the intended form of killing, a certain proportion of killing, a threshold number of killings, it's not a synonym for killing. That's one way you can commit genocide. You can bring about the dissolution and disappearance of a human group by killing physically. But try this. If it's biological extermination that you're talking about, so there are no more of them in biological terms. First of all, many people, until they process through the U.S. Ringer, never understood themselves in those terms. But even defined in those terms, try this. Let's just sterilize them all. 
this sterilized every American Indian, a childbearing age or younger. One generation, they're gone, no one was killed. The bomb, no genocide, excuse me. So much for the idea that genocide is a fancy term for mass murder. They already had laws in the books, concepts having to do with mass murder. It was already prohibited. Didn't need a new word, new statute. It's just killing that's what was the issue. It's bringing about the eradication of the group. Okay, second one. And this one's another shot back across the bow. They're sending him for killing the folks. Affecting policies that impose serious physical or mental harm. Psychological harm is what they're talking about. Mental is the word. You want to talk about living conditions on reservations for Twin Center? You want to talk about life expectancy on reservations? About one third of the general population lifespan. Generation in, generation out. You want to talk about that as being perhaps physically harmful? You want to talk about 2,000 John Wayne movies? Well, John Ford, Hollywood, 10,000 television segments, literature, Winnebago campers, wigwam hotels, Hiawatha pencils, big chief writing tablets, drunken Indians, yuck, yuck, yuck. You want to talk about self-concept and self-esteem that was imparted in the boarding schools? You want to live that way yourself? Wasn't a policy to do that. The boarding schools were. And framing this racial disparagement of mental bodily impact people in these terms under the First Amendment rubric is a matter of official policy as well. If the Germans after the Holocaust were continuing to depict Jews in that fashion, you know what the response would be. How would you know that? How could you document that? Because you see what their response has been to the Holocaust deniers. Oh, yeah. That's round two. Third criteria, prey conditions leading to the physical destruction of the group. Well, that's just another way of saying killing. No, they said killing with one word, killing. They don't need to restate it in a whole sentence. It's two criteria down. How about you put an entire homeland under about 200 feet of water like Canada was planning to do with Great Whale? How about you forcibly disperse Big Mom DNA in order to strip mine the coal? They're scattered across the continent. It's the group that's at issue, not the people. Theoretically, you can commit genocide without killing a single individual. The Lord established that. People invariably die or die early as a result of any of these things. That's not the point. You're bringing about, as a matter of policy, the dissolution and disappearance of a human group. Big Mountain Diné no longer exists. That's happened since 1974. This is not ancient history. It's ongoing right now. They can never reconstitute themselves as a culturally identifiable group, in no small part because the very land they took as their base upon which they established and maintained themselves as a society has been consumed by the drag lines of the Nevada Coal Corporation. Real hard to return and set up shop in the land itself has been eaten. No longer there. What's the anguish for that? Stop being unemployed. Just something like that. They're all, I don't know, 18 months. Lose your moorings and sense of security and identity and so forth. Gives a very, very shallow taste of what the reality that was imposed upon those ground lines. The entire world was ripped away from them. Why? Because you needed voltage cranked out of the Four Corners power plant to feed the casino operations in Las Vegas. That's a major user. Really, really socially important, constructive thing. Destroy an entire people so that you can play. Roulette, maybe. Like that? Good time for the kids. For our kids. Or to pretend that a sinkhole for heat where no one ever lived in the Arizona desert called Phoenix can support several million blue hairs from Kentucky trying to recreate Kentucky in hard desert. 
I mean, do you know how many ergs of energy it takes to run an air conditioner when it's 120 degree ambient temperature? Do you want it to be 68 in your living room while you watch I Love Lucy reruns? That's three. Four, prevention of birth during your group. Well, we were already talking about that. Feds themselves have admitted that the Indian Hill Service, a well intentioned, stretched, and hard working Indian Hill Service, involuntarily sterilized something like 42% of all American Indian women of childbearing age between 1971 and 75. One just involuntary. A lot of cases it was unwitting. They didn't even. I had a student who came in in the middle of a family crisis when I was first at the University of Colorado. And I mean, it was it was awful. I didn't know what to say to her. Her husband was leaving her because she was barren. He said. Turned out that she had been sterilized in IHS clinic in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, but she didn't even know it. That was revealed later. Yeah. That's four. Five transferred children. Of course, transferred children from a targeted group to a targeting group. So they're raised to not know who they're supposed to be. They're raised to believe they're someone other than who they are. Or in any case, to see themselves through the lens of those who despise them enough to take them and train them to see themselves that way to eradicate Indian culture. That was the object of the forced transfers to boarding schools. But it wasn't just boarding schools, and it's still going on with blind adoptions and so forth. Yeah, you may look in the mirror and you see a phenotype Indian looking back, but your birth records are sealed. You don't know who your biological parents are. You can't know who your people are either. Now, where does that leave you? Well, it's for your own good. Yeah. Well, I got a few ideas of what might be for your own good, too, Jack. But you call those criminal activities. I call these criminal activities, too, and I just recited the law that says that. But we, we're not really constrained in the United States by compliance with international law to say, or to cite the United Nations resolutions as the basis for attacking Iran. Let me say this. A convention in international law is law. A resolution is just that. It's a resolution. You cite resolutions to go to war and kill a million people, and yet you don't consider yourself bound by the convention because it's not our law. That's the German defense of Nuremberg. Ecocide, genocide equals homicide. We have both factors to contend with. And where I was going to go with that, and I'm going to stop and not go there, is when you see that one clearly and you call it by your right name, you respond to it in ways that are different than you think it's reasonable or something other than what it is, which is why it always presents first line of defense, presents itself as something other than what it is. The opposite of everything is true. And if you break through that, you're a target. Well, give them some more targets. But how do you deal with a Nazi regime? Just to lock in on the known genocide. We don't have to get into the ecology here. Just with the genocide. How do you deal with a Nazi regime? How do you respond to it? What's a reasonable approach? What's your posture? You're going to petition it? You're going to make morally persuasive arguments? How about a little rally in downtown Berlin? You going to elect new people to the Reichstag? You going to suggest that the countries that have been overrun have representation in the Reichstag? And for those countries that have been overrun by the German armies in 1940 and 41, getting yourself someone elected to the German parliament is your solution, your self-determination. This is progress. No, it's building yourself into the system and legitimating that system as if it were something other than what it is. You're going to write letters to the editor? You're going to devise new courses? How about let's shoot a videotape? Fight paths, anyone? 
what the Third Reich needs is better bike paths. Let's be reasonable, nice, polite. Let's don't offend. What I'm worried about alienating the Nazi electorate. Don't you think it's getting better? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. And oh, by the way, they'll let you do these things. There were letters written, protests made, petitions drawn, and everything else. Meanwhile, they went right on killing Jews. Like this country did with its little imperial adventure in Southeast Asia. We're not the Nazis because, look, we allow demonstrations in the streets. Yeah, but they don't change anything. You're going right ahead and grinding people into hamburger, four million beef. Well, violence is no solution. It's the guy who's ordering the bombing. Oh, my God. we got to do things selectively here, but it's got to be peaceful. Right back there in the corner. Today, and this is no put down to the people. There's a whole selection of hats for which military campaign American Indian veterans could take pride in having participated in. We're fighting for our colonizers. We're not worried about that being violent now, are we? Who said it had to be peaceful? Well, they're killing what we depend upon for survival, where they're foreclosing on our future generations, while they're Self-evidently, doing what they're doing, continuing, we have to be nice and polite and not alienate the people doing it. We can't declare things in clear terms. You come for my children, I'll kill you. If I encounter you in a rape, I am not morally required to bear witness. I am morally required to intervene and stop it by whatever means are available to me. Maybe I won't be successful, but I'm obligated to try. This does not maintain itself peacefully. That's what the military is about. That's why, it, well, apparently left. There was one person in a room packing a 9 millimeter. Wasn't one of us. What's that for? Who's it to be used on? Just prevent disorder? What is the order? It's being maintained. Order is not a virtue in and of itself. There was plenty of order in the Third Reich. You foreclose no option available to you from a position of disempowerment when you've got People depending upon you for your survival to protect them. None. That's an immoral act. And we hear these false equivalencies being made continuously. The most violent regime on the planet in the 1960s was the United States of America, and the pontificators were saying, Violence is bad and open. Those are the people perpetrating unparalleled violence. Now you hear the analysis. Well, the right wing's getting a little out of control. You know, they're talking, blowing things up. Look at entertainment today. Well, in the 60s, you had the left, and now it's the right. False equivalency. Absolute slang. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Carl Armstrong, who I mentioned earlier, who blew up the math center, the Army Research Center, that was doing the telemetry and stuff for what was happening in Vietnam. They denied it, but that's what it was doing. Right, wrong, or indifferent. He was trying to hold a genocide that had claimed millions of victims at that point. He killed somebody in the process. It's not to be celebrated that the guy died. Although the guy wasn't innocent, he's presented as if he's innocent of anything. He's engaged in military research. 
So no, he's a physicist, not a mathematician. He's just doing the stuff that makes solid state. Targeting devices available to the military at an early date. There is no pure science. Now you need the science. It all has application. That's why they fund it. So on the one hand, you have people right, wrong, or different. I'm not going to even argue that point right now, trying to stop a Holocaust. And on the other hand, you've got people who are engaged in violence trying to prevent 35 million of their countrymen from having basic health care. And you tell me these are equivalents? That's how they want you not to think. I can't tell you what to do. I wouldn't try. I don't live in your communities. But there is no moral calculus, ethical calculus, or any other calculus involved in this other than to win. Small victories, large victories. Small ones lead to large ones. The point is to get it done. If you need to halt something, get it halted. Don't come and tell me if they're dumping stuff at the end of the streets in the reserve in your town because they treat you and your people alike as a waste dump. Dump it back. At the very least, put a line across the street. You can do that. That's disorderly. Yeah, break out of the order. They filmed the business dumping the stuff right in front of a TV camera in an interview of this. This is a story that we heard today. Load it up in the trucks. You got trucks. Take it back to that business. You know its location. Dump it in their parking lot. You don't have to have refrigerators and stuff for your kids to get killed in, trying to play in, or be you with the responsibility of going out and taking the doors off. No, it's somebody else's garbage, and they're treating you like garbage. Walk the street. Dump it back. And if you really want to make the point, rent some porta potties. You can afford that. Use them for a week as a community. Get the tanker there and dump that in their lot and see how they like it. They'll stop when you do. Just one minor suggestion of a line of action. Every community can take it. We've got ourselves convinced that we'd have to play by a different set of rules as a pacified population in the face of a genocidal, ecocidal ultimately homicidal reality, and that's a recipe for doing something none of us want to do. I say as human beings, we have a response to require, we have a right to respond in our own behalf, as Malcolm X put it, by any means necessary, by any means necessary under conditions like these. But Malcolm didn't take it far enough. It was implied, but just say it straight out. You have the right to do it for yourself. Every single person in this room and any other human being is being treated that way has a right to use whatever means are available and necessary in order to change that equation. But you have more than a right. You have an obligation to hand that change along to your children and children's children and children's children's children seven generations out in the future. That's an obligation. That's a responsibility. And I don't think it's something, although that's a Native tradition, I don't think that's something unique to Native people. I think that's something that we ought to be able to come together on. And stop pleading for those who are foreclosed and killing our future and the planet in terms of its ability to sustain life in the forms that we respect it and know it pleading with them to do something different when they're afflicted with a calculus of destroying the natural world and replacing it with something of service to themselves. That's fundamental of you. It's not a difference of opinion. It's not an abstract thing. It's a concrete, lived, agonizing reality that has to be altered. We have to do that in concrete terms and not by respecting genocidal and ecocidal and homicidal points of view. Okay. 
With that said, which is more than I intended to say, I got a big mouth and it tends to work that way. I'm going to thank you very much for listening. Wedo and the Takayasu, all my relations, all my relations. We can deal with some Q&A. We can deal with some comments, but I'm going to monopolize the speech of Pai tonight. We don't really have time for other people to make speeches, comments, yes. We'll deal with a certain amount of heckling. Bit was, no brick bats. I tend to throw them back. So before we go in any place, I'll volunteer. If you want to set up that uh, English camp for English speakers, I'm your first volunteer, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got some specimens that I'd like to put in the museum for that. All right. <laughs>